Let's make welcome our speaker for today. I have a few questions to ask you. Um, I actually need a, a real answer. If you could just raise your hand if I ask this. I really appreciate it. How many, how many in this congregation believe that God is good? Okay, praise God. How many in this congregation believe that uh, God really loves you? Praise God, almost everyone. How many of you believe that God will never leave you nor forsake you, even to the point of death? Have you answered these questions in times of testing? Have you? Would you answer the same way? You know, in the last few weeks, I've been faced with these questions, hard questions. Even it got me to thinking about myself. I've had a, a kid come up to me and said, how can I keep praying to a God that I pray to change my dad who's cheating on my mom and my, but my mom doesn't want to divorce. She, she wants to fight for the marriage. But my dad is completely cold and, and just doing all what, whatever he, need, he wants to do. But there you go. She's in tears. She's, my heart is being crushed. I see her broken. I mean, how can I pray to a God that won't do something about this injustice? You know, I have this. Uh, other um, person who came up to me and said, you know, I've, I've been just working. I've been working and working all my life to support my family. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a good person. I mean, I don't hurt people. And then I get sick. I get sick. I actually go to church. And I get sick. He allows this sickness to come in my life and just change it all. And this is from a woman who speaks, you know, bed bound now, so young. I've had senior pastors and, man, their children, actually just a son, got sick with cancer. And, it, and I, from, from the time that I've encountered them and this couple, they're, they're so Christ-like and so gentle. And, they, and, and you hear them praying night after night that I would, I would be with them. Their son wasn't healed. He passed not long ago. Would you still be able to answer the same way I asked you in the beginning? Because these things happen. I mean, I, I, it got me thinking, what are we not doing right? Are we not praying hard enough? Are we not obeying the Lord enough? Are we not? walking in the line that he wants us to while he's allowing all these disasters to come our way. It was just like you, I uh, no words to say, so I turned to the Lord and his word, and I'm going to be sharing with you just three reminders regarding our faith from 2 Timothy 1. It's very straightforward, it's very simple, but I hope that it blesses you as it blessed me. We're going to cover only the first few verses from uh, cha uh, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to 10, because I want you guys to uh, take the time and, and read about this beautiful letter. 2 Timothy 1, 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day. And I constantly remind you, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother, Louis, and in your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame 
the gift of God which is in you through the laying on, on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, grace, mercy, and peace, would you silence our hearts, Lord? Jesus, God, would you speak to us right now? Enable your people to hear your word, Holy Spirit. God of Father, we rely upon you, your word. Let it give life to these flesh and bones. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen? Amen. So just a little background. 2 Timothy, obviously, is the second, uh, second personal letter of Paul to his, apost- to his uh, disciple Timothy. But uh, I've been looking it up a little bit in a little uh, research. 2 Timothy is actually the last letter of Paul that he's ever written. Um, 2 Timothy was written about two to four years after his first personal letter to Timothy, which is the the first Timothy as we know it, Apostle Paul, already at the golden age, had a, about a year or two of freedom. He was in prison. He had a year or two of freedom, but he was recaptured. He was recaptured, and he knew that he was about to be executed by um, em- Emperor Nero. You look it up in history, you'll know him. This emperor began a major persecution of Christians in, in AD 64, and 64, and this movement, it had spread across the Roman Empire, and they were blaming Christians for this so-called great fire of Rome. Um, Christians were ostracized, they were rejected, they were publicly tortured, they were, they were just murdered, martyred, and all that you can think of. And so Ap- Apostle Paul, in his dungeon, in his dark dungeon in prison, penned these famous last words. About AD 66, 67, um, the prison in, in, in Rome, I've seen one. There's a, uh, usually there's a sewer that runs through the, through the, through the prison. It is uh, dark, it's damp, it's cold, it's isolated. And in this case, Paul is even chained. So re- imagine this man writing this personal letter to his disciple, his son in the faith, Timothy whom he had uh, put in charge of a young church in in Ephesus, in Rome. Now, if anyone had the the right to ask, why, God? I really believe this is the man. I mean, if if you can just collect all the credit that he has done for the glory of the kingdom of God, he has done so much, much more than we could ever imagine. I mean, he's responsible for leading multitudes to Christ, He's responsible for almost writing the entire New Testament of our Bible. I mean, Apostle Paul would be the man to ask the question, God, why me? Why me? I mean, I've done nothing but good. I love the freedom, right? But, but instead of me going out, on, I, was, I was just thinking, you know, why, why didn't God allow him to just go out on a nice vacation, you know, on a nice island? Live the rest of his dying life. But instead, he is, he is locked up and about to be executed. And this is amazing to me that when he writes this letter, he opens it with Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Man, in the situation that he's in, he's still saying that, He he is still holding on to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. He still thanks God in his letter. He says, I thank God 
Imagine being in chain in this dungeon. I think God is probably starving. And he goes, whom I serve. Amazing. Amazing. Now, before I get started with my points, let me just reiterate this. Iterate this. Sorry, I'm a little foppish today. (laughs) Romans 10, 9 to 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart you believe and are justified, and with your mouth you confess and are saved. Family, if you indeed believe and confess, as Scripture says, then indeed we have the promise of life, of eternal life that is in Christ Jesus. So even if you pass away now or maybe a little bit later, then there's no need to fear because the promise of life in Christ stands true. And if you call yourself a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, then indeed you are servants of the living King by the will of God. Whatever you do, whether you think it's great or small, it all counts in the sight of God because each soul you serve, or even better, each soul you win for the Lord counts to the glory of the one and only King. Let's get that straight. Can I get an amen? Praise God. So there are three simple reminders about our faith that I'd like to share with you. The first one is this. Remember that the author of our faith is also the perfecter of our faith. If you read 2 Timothy 1-4, it says, Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Tears filling with joy. You know, when, when, I, when I read this, it's as if Paul rewrote Hebrews 12 too, which, which says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He went in in suffering, thinking about the joy that he's going to have sitting at the right hand of God. See, brothers and sisters, I know this is simple, but really, the author of our faith is also the perfecter of it. Yes, he is faithful to finish the work he starts in us, as in Philippians 1.6. But let us not forget that for, in order for a work to finish, he must continue it. Rain or shine, sickness or death, whatever circumstances, whatever situation that he allows to let you in, allows you to be, it's him perfecting your faith. And you know what? He is faithful to finish the work. Guess who the work is? It's you and me. We are the work he is finishing until the day of Jesus Christ. You see, if we are his masterpiece, then you best believe that he continues the process of making you a masterpiece. Until Jesus Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19. Christ-likeness, as some it's called. Simple, right? So if we believe that he is the potter, then we are the pottery. Question, do potters remold broken pots? Do potters crush imperfect pots to make it perfect? You see, look and see. Look and see for yourself in in YouTube if you want how the potter works, works the clay. If I was the clay, I would be complaining. You see? But if Jesus is the author of the book of your lives, then he holds the pen and the notepad. So quit taking the pen from him and let him write your story. See, but the problem with most of us is we like to take it. We like to be in control. You know, this is a new revelation to me. What does perfection look like? Those show me that the perfection looks like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When, and then he was lifted up to heaven, seated, seated at the right hand of God. That is glorious in all ways. See, but, but more visible to us is not his lift, his, him being resurrected and being lifted up. 
to the throne of God, more visible to us is the pain and suffering. More, more, um, it's so much more easy to, to focus on, on the sadness and the grief. Isn't it? Isn't it where often we meet people in humble circumstances and, and this is usually the times that they come to God? You know what God showed me? Uh, asking why isn't really the, que- the right question to ask when people are going through things because asking why requires an explanation. And when there's an explanation, I don't think that any of us in here could ever understand the capacity in how God functions. You see, what we see with our eyes is limited only to the time and encounter we have of that person. Our perspective and understanding is so small. Our brain capacity could not comprehend how God works. Our memory is so temporary. We have internal biases. We have stereotypes. We have poor judgments. and A lot of us lack understanding. Let me give you an example. So if you were to meet the prodigal son when he was at his lowest in the pig's pen, when he was eating the food of the, of, of the, of the, of the pig, easily we could, we, could, we could conclude with our mind, oh, that's uh, his, uh, not royalty, this, this one's just a fool. See, because we see, we see with our eyes, and that, that is often how we, 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 we deal with things. We see it and we judge it. But had you meet the prodigal son when he was still at his father's house, you would say, oh, his royalty. He has fine linen and he has jewelry. You see, the way we encounter people, we encounter them only in, in segments of pictures. We never see the whole picture. But oftentimes we focus on, on the things that we see and we go, why, God? Why? I mean, that's such a good person. But you never really know the entire story. And in God's working, a lot of it is mysterious. A lot of it crosses generations. See, another example. If you were to meet King David when he was still hiding in the caves, or when when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, you would never have seen the king that God calls a man after God's own heart. See, what God showed me really is that our minds are so small. And the capacity that we can grasp him is really not that much. That Even if an explanation is given, we would still question it. Asking why really means, do I really trust? God in this? Or do I really trust God through this? But we're reminded that in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, that we were called to live by faith, not by sight. Because what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. So everything that you see, pain, suffering, whatever you see, sin, that is temporary and it soon shall pass too. I love the picture of Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane when he was pleading before God the Father before the pains of Calvary. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Take this cross. Take it from me. You know, it's so easy to get carried over by the hard circumstances, the agony of our situations, the emotions of what God allows us to go through. But what I love what Jesus follows it with is, he goes, yet not my will, but yours be done. He fought his cross. Three times he pleaded before God. And if that was me, I would have said, you know, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me and give it to the devil. I mean, make him carry it. He started all this mess anyway, right? Isn't that what, isn't that what we want? Someone else to carry our cross. Someone else to to deal with our circumstances, you know, escape it, run from it. 
someone else to pay for our debt. I mean, it's so much easier when someone else has, could suffer for our, our, of the consequences of our disobedience and foolishness. Wouldn't that be nice? You just keep swiping away with your credit card and someone else pays for it? I mean, man, that would be awesome, right? But the problem with that is it doesn't cater to growth. It caters to you looking to God like his Santa Claus. Or it, it's like looking to God and his uh, a, a grocery store. You get what you want and then you leave. Leaving everything else that doesn't matter to you. But what happens often? We're handed things that we don't want. We're given crosses. What are your crosses? You know it's a cross when you really don't want it. But you have to really deny yourself and carry it anyway. Daily. Husbands, don't, tell your, don't say it to your wives. Crosses, you know, they... Um, Is it a disease for you? What are the crosses that burden your shoulders and burden your heart? But God says, deny yourself and carry it in a way. Is it a harsh, sad fact about your life? A past that is constantly reminding you of your old self? Is it a family, your family member you're fed up with and can't do anything about? What are these things? That if you carry it daily, it becomes really burdensome if you don't surrender it to the Lord. See, crosses usually make you ask, why me, God? But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. But he follows it with this. Because for whoever, verse 24 for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Brothers and sisters, if you want to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for Christ, he will save it. See, crosses, they make you beg, please, no, God. No, it makes you weary, it makes you tired. You feel it all, the weirdness of having to deal with things. I don't know what it is. And the reason why we fight it so much is because many of us, actually all of us, have this tendency to want to be alive. The cross, you know, it, it leads us to death. Death to ourselves. When every being inside of us, we want to be recognized. We want to be significant. We want to be on the top of the pile, not the bottom, not six feet under. But the cross shows us to walk like Jesus did. Not defending himself, walking in the will of God, the Father. And it's so hard. It's so hard to see. So hard to see when you see someone having to, to enter into death. So hard to see when, when you yourself have to surrender it all. Even if you don't understand it and you just, God, okay, have your way. reason why God wants us to die to ourselves because it's only then that his resurrection power will take effect because there's really no need to resurrect the living you see if you want to experience the resurrection power of God the life of God the spirit of God filling you in perfection then don't be afraid to die to yourself Take up your cross and follow Christ. Indeed, there are tears, there are joys, there are many seasons, and it will come and will, God will allow it, using it to, 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 to lead you to this place where he wants you refined and perfected. But it is only through death to ourselves perfection comes. 
And those of you questioning still, you know, God, why? Why? Why is my life so hard? I'm, I'm telling you, keep pleading before God. You know, keep pleading before God. Say, Father, please take this cup from me as many as you want. At least you're talking to God about it. But what I dream of, what I pray for, is that you finish that powerful statement that Jesus said. Father, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. I love what Apostle Paul, when he was pleading before God to take something from him, in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 9, he, he said this, to keep me from becoming conceited, because he, he had seen a lot of things, because of these surpassingly great revelations there was given me a thorn in my flesh i don't know what that is a thorn it was a messenger of satan to torment me three times i pleaded with the lord to take it away from me but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness and look at paul's confession he goes therefore I will boast all the more about my weaknesses, more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight, he's gone crazy, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. That is the picture perfect of a surrendered life. When you surrender all that you think you have in strength and whatever you hold dear to you to before God. Whatever it is. Some of us in here have darling sins. We call them darling sins because we keep coming back to them even though we've repented of them a million times. Some of us in here, we have a darling past. It's done. It's over. But we keep going back to it, especially in an argument. We, we take that back and we keep smearing it in, in, in people's faces or, or, or on our own. Time to let go. Let it go. Man, I wish I could sing that song. <laughs> My second point. Apostle Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 1 to 5, he goes, I have, re I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Louis, and in your mother, Eunice. And I'm persuaded that now lives in you also. My second point sincere faith overflows through generations. You know, another word for sincere is it's, it's heartfelt. It's genuine, it is honest, it is wholehearted, it is earnest. This is our prayer for our generations, that our sincere, genuine, honest faith would carry over to the next. You see, faith without passion just becomes religion. Go to, Sunday on, 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 go to church on Sunday and on six days is free for all. That's religion. But faith in action fueled with passion, that's the stuff that overflows. You see, you just can't fake it. Jesus said, I am the vine, my father is the gardener. Whoever doesn't remain in me, they die. They don't bear fruit. It withers. The only one that produces are the ones that stay in line with the vine. See, faith, faith without action, we know this is dead. We don't want religious people. We want passionate people who are in love with Christ. Timothy's grandma, Lewis, she did it right. She had sincere faith, which her daughter saw, which, she, which then her daughter gave to Timothy, showed him that sincere faith. So when you have faith that stands in sub full submission to God's will, you can guarantee that your children and your disciples will carry it over to, it's like handing on a torch. There's fuel for the fire. It doesn't die out. Because really, at the end of the day, 
it's not your advices, you know, your words of wisdom in times of good. It's just in times of testing, in the daily of your life, when you're going through hard things and, and, and your, your, your children or your disciple are, are looking at you, how are they dealing with these difficult situations? These are the things that teach. These are the things that really speak volume. And praise God. You know, it it breaks my heart that there wasn't a dad there. Just a grandma and a mom and then the son. And I think it's it's only rightful that that we we, uh, just... I think give a hand for, for our mothers here who contend for their children. Yeah? You know, I see a lot of dads getting praised for, like, making so much money, bringing home the dough. But, you know, I, I, I truly believe it because I, I do the work. But I think my wife does the harder thing. You know, to show sincerity, faith. To, to, to practice that even if without sleep. I'm not a Christian if I don't have sleep. But my wife, you know, she, man, I can't put my daughter in check. She could, like, put her in check. You know, we got to give more, I think, more credit to the mothers. We, we Often we, we put them aside because they're just household workers. No, I think they are the ultimate worker of God. Raising up the next generation. Wouldn't you agree with me? Praise God, mothers. They're amazing. A sincere faith. It doesn't end there. Apostle Paul goes on in verse 6. He goes, for this reason I remind you you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. See, a sincere faith without effort to growth and maturity, it just becomes stagnant and unproductive. Paul reminds Timothy to fan into flames the gift of God. It's like taking an ember and fanning it and making it into like a forest fire. Co- Peter coins it very well in 2 Peter 1 to 5, verse 1, 5 to 8. He goes, for this very reason, he, he, Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. There's an adding. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what it means to add, to fan into flame. You know, we don't have have a, a spirit of timidity where we are afraid of situations that God has given us. He has given us the spirit of power, the spirit of love. You know, the most under... I don't know, stated enough is uh, self-discipline. I know I need a lot of it. But praise God that there's all aspects, you know, to the gift that God has given us. This is what we've been longing to see for a long time in our church. And this is what we are seeing in our church. Praise God. You know, I see families, they're, they're struggling, but they're fighting to stay together. I see parents who, you know, come from a terrible past, but they're really trying hard to pass in the torch of their faith to the next generation, their children. And I see fruit from all aspects of ministry, even those that are just in homes or in school or work. I see, you know, the youth bring their, their classmates or their parents, and, and it's such a beautiful thing to see. And, and to, testify, to testify to this, I'd like you, please, to, to welcome our, our very own Sister Aya. She's going to close us out. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. um, I didn't grow up in a Christian.
Christian home, yes, my mom was Christian, but a Christian home meant the entire family that lived in that home, meaning my dad and my brother Jim. Yes, there were Christian verses everywhere. My mom is known for that, of her posters all over the house. I think it also took it to another level when we started taking Operation Solid Life because she had to memorize the verses. So you would see it in the bathroom, you would see it in her car, you would see it even blocking her mirror, (laughs) you would even see it on the fridge, on the table, on her phone. This meant that my mom was, was the only one praying for a family of five to know who Jesus is, to fall in love with him, to have a relationship with him, to be in the same church and to live a life that is pleasing to him, not just about knowing him but to live a life that is pleasing to him. My family was nowhere near perfect. My parents fought. And um, they were always walking on eggshells with the word divorce. For as long as I can remember, my parents were separated, not by choice, but because of work. My dad lived in the guest house at his work, and my mom lived with us. We'll see my dad every other weekend, but we won't ever see them together. I grew up in the youth and now serving in the youth. It really, it really wasn't until these past two years where I started wanting more for my family. I started fighting for my family with my mom in prayer. I didn't talk to her about it. Um, I just, I just did it. I made it intentional to to talk to my parents. I made it intentional to be open to them, to spend time with them, and just to be around them. It wasn't. Before, it was only my mom who was going to Bible study or church. But it wasn't until this year where both of my parents are going to Bible study together. (laughs) My dad goes to church on the weekend that he's off, even when my mom has to work or even when she's out of town. He's um, serving in the Topanga Terrace rehab with my mom and a few others on Saturdays. They go out to eat for lunch, for dinner, and on weekends. And I know this because I don't get invited and I see pictures on Facebook. (laughs) But that's okay. (laughs) My mom pretty much lives with him now. And... um, my mom's Bible study group consists of her coworkers from all different places that she now sits with, serves with, and does life with. Can you mark up the time now, please? <laughs> because of this woman's perseverance in prayer, her unwavering faith, her endless mercy, and a heart that continues to go to the ends of the earth, I am so proud. To carry. Not the generational curse. But the generational blessing. Because of her sincere faith. That overflows through generations that she has poured out into our family. I can say that the burden in my heart to see my workplace as a mission field to populate heaven was from her. I've been working at Aegis for seven years, and it was because of her that I got this job. (laughs) I have coworkers that are now attending our Sunday church services and are, uh, and are attending our Bible studies regularly. I have co 
Morris, whose children are now attending the youth ministry regularly. Sorry. I can speak for those who are still praying for their entire family to be saved, whether you are in the youth, young adults, crossroads, or even right now as a parent. I can speak for the youth whose parents are always gone, most of the time, not because their parents do not love them, but because their parents give them what love looks like by providing for them and by being the best parents they know how to be. I can speak for the youth whose parents are always fighting and on the verge of divorce. And finally, I can speak for the parents, the mom or the dad, who is the only one contending for the salvation of their family. Because my family is an evidence of an answered prayer. So point number three, <laughs> be proud of your story because it gives God the glory. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, it says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather join, me, rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. You see, testimony is defined as something that someone says while formally promising to tell the truth or proof of evidence that something exists or is true. In this definition alone, it says formally promising to tell the truth or proof of evidence that something is true. My dad is an evidence of an answered prayer. My mom is an evidence of unwavering faith and intercessor. My brother James is an evidence of an undercover servant who brings coffee and breakfast to church services every Sunday service. <laughs> He's here before me. <laughs> and that's actually something that my mom started doing also a long time ago. My brother Jameson, who isn't here because he's out of town, is an evidence of a promise that God is going to fulfill. This is not just my story. This is my testimony. My testimony because in every season and every trial, God broke through and revealed his truth and his love for me and for my family. You have a story, but that story will become a testimony when you allow God to move mountains for you, when you allow God to restore you, when you allow God to heal your entire family, when you allow God to guide you, when you allow God to love you and to lead you to the truth. Your life will always glorify him when you allow him to break through. Amen. <laughs>